I'm Tim Christ, and it's my pleasure to um, welcome you to our fourth annual Philip Roth Lecture. We're delighted to have Sean Wilentz as tonight's lecturer, and he follows in the footsteps of Zadie Smith, Robert Caro, and Salman Rushdie. We launched this uh, lecture series with Mr. Roth's full blessing uh, as a way of anticipating the Philip Roth Personal li Library before its actual presence here. Uh, we're grateful to the members of our lecture committee who are listed in your program, and we're delighted that three members are here tonight, um, Nicole Krauss and Ben Taylor and Rosemary Steinbaum. Thank you. And I've been asked to remind you that these index cards are for writing questions. Um, Professor Wilentz has agreed to take a few questions at the end. As you know, uh, Mr. Roth left his personal library of some 7,000 volumes to the Newark Public Library. They will be installed in due course in the room on this floor, just next door, uh, here in the main library what Mr. Roth called my other Newark home, my first other home. The card that was left on your chair gives, a, uh, gives you a sense of how the room will uh, combine his books with space for seminars and researchers linked to an exhibit area. And we expect to start work on, on renovating that space in the next few months. And this project follows on the uh, renovation of our James Brown African American room, which we opened at the beginning of this year, of the cleaning of the marble on this floor and in the entry atrium. I hope you noticed that. It's probably the first time in 100 years that that marble has been cleaned, and it cleaned up really nicely. And um, uh, later next year, at some point next year, we expect to start work on renovating the space for the New Jersey Hispanic Research and Information Center and the La Sala Hispano America to combine those two on the third floor. So a lot is happening here at the library. It's an exciting time. We have already received about 900 of Mr. Roth's books from his New York City apartment. Um, and we have displayed some examples uh, in those two cases out in the hallway. I hope you had a chance to spot them. Uh, they include uh, some ex uh, drafts of two of his novels, uh, examples from um, uh, Patriarchy and um, uh, Patrimony, sorry, and The Anatomy Lesson that Joel Conero uh, kindly gave the library a couple years ago. Um, Mr. Roth was a very close reader, and many of the books uh, include his underlinings and marginalia, and some of the books almost flutter from all the yellow post-it notes that he's included to mark passages in the, in, in the books. In the coming months, we hope to receive the other 6,000 volumes from his home in Connecticut, Warren, Connecticut. So there are lots of discoveries to be made and insights gleaned. And it will take time to process the books um, and begin to discover the, the riches the books contain before they can be made available to the public, again, in the Philip Roth Personal Library next door. If you saw the long article in the Wall Street Journal on Friday, you will know that Mr. Roth also made a bequest of um, that will generate about $80,000 a year, every year, to purchase books and materials for the library's general collection. Uh, this was a wonderful gift that will benefit not only the library, but the city of Newark as a whole, and we're immensely grateful. We invite your support to help make the Philip Roth Personal Library a reality as a place for students to explore his works, for scholars to gain new insights, as a destination for fans of Mr. Roth's novels from around the world who will be attracted to Newark, but perhaps most importantly, as a place for programming to engage Newarkers in creative expression. Together, we will make it happen. Now it's my honor to um, uh, welcome Brenda Wineapple, 
uh, the distinguished literary critic, essayist, and historian who has written lyrically about, among others, uh, Emily Dickinson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, Leo and Gertrude Stein, and most recently about the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. She will introduce tonight's Philip Roth lecturer. Brenda? I want to thank the lecture committee, everyone involved, and especially Rosemary Steinbaum, who got me here in no time at all. Um, and of course, I'm uh, really thrilled to be here in this beautiful space, and um, to which uh, I owe everyone as part of, of the evening, and of course, the incomparable Philip Roth. What a great honor it is. I'm to introduce the distinguished Sean Wilentz, George Henry Davis, 1980, 1886, Professor of American History at Princeton, a mouthful, and the terrific person you selected to deliver the esteemed Philip Roth lecture. For me, it's an opportunity I find both daunting and exciting, but it does give me a chance to say how essential Sean Wilentz is to our present times, both as a historian and a human being. As you probably know, Philip Roth, upon his retirement, was studying even more American history than he already knew or had imagined so perspicaciously. And he chose his friend, the eminent Sean Wilentz, to be his go-to guide. As was typical for Mr. Roth, he chose wisely and well. For there's no historian better or smarter or more humane and witty or more wide-ranging in his accomplishments. Alas, though, to do all his honors and talents justice, I'd have to cut deep into his lecture, which I've been graciously warned not to do. That said, and though it gets boring pretty fast to list the activities as someone of such a broad reach and impact, not just on the history, um, not just on history or the writing of history, but on our present moment, let me give you a sample of Professor Wilentz's work. He's author of The Capacious, The Rise of American Democracy, Jefferson to Lincoln, a finalist for the Pulitzer and awarded the coveted Bancroft Prize. There's his Age of Reagan, a study of American politics post Watergate that goes a very long way toward helping us understand the current state of affairs, as does, by the way, his recent and characteristically brilliant review in the New York Review of Books about the policies of the Bush administration and their undeniable relation to the horrific policies of now. It's one of the many he's written for them and numerous other publications and some 300 plus articles, reviews, and op-eds. Not to worry, I'm not gonna list them all. He's also edited with Grail Marcus, The Briar and the Rose, Death, Love, Liberty, and the American Ballad. And no surprise, he's received an ASCAP Deems Taylor Award twice and not one, but two Grammy nom nominations for an exceptional music writing. His insightful book, Bob Dylan in America, is also wonderfully sly. I'm thinking of his section on Allen Ginsberg, keen and chock full of revelatory connections like the relation of Dylan to Aaron Copeland. I wouldn't be shocked to learn that this book snagged Dylan the Nobel. He's the author of Chance Democratic, New York City and the Rise of the American Working Class, whose title I love, since it's taken from, from, our, from our mutual admit, admiration for the marvelous Walt Whitman. For Sean Wilentz writes about Whitman and Tom Paine and Du Bois and Barack Obama with ease, as well as about weirdo political cults in the 19th century. He writes about Andrew Jackson for the presidential series whose editorial stewardship he took over from Arthur Schlesinger. And if that's not enough, frankly, I don't know how he does it. He's also editor-in-chief of an eight-volume American history series while he continues to teach and to write about ethics and reformers and men and women of good and not so good will. For as it should now be obvious, Sean doesn't write about history in a vacuum. Beyond superlative history that covers the length and breadth of the American past, his peerless political writing is bar none. To give one example, 
his 1998 testimony against the blinkered impeachment of Bill Clinton before the House Judiciary Committee is unsurprisingly quoted far more than anyone else's. History will track you down and condemn you for your cravenness, he told them. That is to say, Sean Malentz not only writes history, but in writing he creates history, which is to say, which is doubtless why Mr. Roth cared so deeply for him. That is, because in the ways Roth was an historian, Sean Wilentz is a novelist, seeing people and events with the novelist's eye, in the round with their failures and successes, and without their knowing, as we do, what the outcome of their actions will be. He understands the fragile, the wayward, the unintended, and the accidental, which is the stuff of both history and the novel. In other words, Professor Wilentz writes lived history, the way we've lived and experienced living in time, both in the past and in the present, through politics as well as poetry. And he shows us how they're connected, lest we forget, as we do, at our peril. History is now. History is connectedness. It does not exist by itself over there in a dusty corner of the province of the out of reach. No one knows better than he. It's no wonder to me, then, that he's been acknowledged, both by those who share his views and those who don't, as one of our greatest living historians. And he's a great historian because he's also, not least of all, a great human being. He's kind and thoughtful, compassionate and unstinting. I've received notes from him on two long manuscripts that were scrupulous, lucid, intelligent, and humbling. There was no good reason for him to do this except that he's generous, and beyond that, he wants to make sure we get it all right. That leads me to something else I must mention, something finally related to the lecture he'll give tonight and relevant to the subject of his latest quite remarkable book, No Property in Man in which he begins rewriting the history of American anti-slavery, beginning with his stunning and, stunning stunning, stunning and stunningly pers persuasive argument about slavery and anti-slavery at the nation's founding. What this book demonstrates is one of Sean Wilentz's most distinctive qualities, courage. With commanding skill, Sean Wilentz is not afraid to write against the historical grain, to challenge the status quo, to reverse expectations, to reconsider an argument, an assumption, a historical premise, even his own, and in public. Willingly, controversially, he investigates tired historical or political judgments and prejudices in order to learn for himself what if anything, lies beneath them, even when he knows he's likely putting a target on his back. But by thinking and writing as the responsible, brilliant, independent, and gutsy historian that he is, he acts as a guide, the very guide Philip Roth chose, the guide we need in perilous and craven times, in any time, tonight, in any night, a cherished friend who lights up the dark with knowledge, scholarship, a great prose style, wisdom, and, let it be said, a little bit of mischief to boot. I give you Sean Willink. Okay, you can all go home now. <laughs> that was extraordinary. I, from the bottom of my heart, Brenda, thank you. I have you to thank for this. It is a great honor to be here, to see what a wonderful crowd. Um, many people to thank to start. Um, first of all, to Tim and, and where are you, Rosemary. Um, to everyone connected with this magnificent institution in this magnificent building. Um, it's been a treat from start, and I hope this will not be the finish of our connection. Um, I want to thank the, um, the committee that, that chose me, um, you know, the list of names. 
I don't belong on that list of names. Um, but I'm very, very, very honored to, uh, to be there. So thank you to, to all of you. Um, what else? I, I, and Philip. Someone was asking me earlier during dinner when I actually met Philip or when he met me. And it does go back to 1998. Um, I did testify before the House Judiciary Committee during the Clinton impeachment and uh, uh, made a lot of Republicans very, very angry. But I also made other people angry with me, it turned out. A certain Metropolitan Daily, I won't go into the exact name of which Metropolitan Daily, um, you know, when I, um, criticized me for being gratuitously condescending to the Republicans on the committee. To which I replied, or wanted to reply, there was nothing gratuitous about it. <laughs> they earned my contempt. Um, but, you know, it was not a not happy time for the country, or, or really for me, when in the mail came a book, and it was I Married a Communist by Philip Roth, and I said, who's sending me I Married a Communist from Philip Roth? It turned out Philip Roth was sending me a copy of I Married a Communist by Philip Roth, saying, with a wonderful inscription, saying that he very much appreciated what I had to say and the way that I said it. So he got it. They'd earned our contempt. Um, and, and, and from then on, it was just a, a, a beautiful friendship, a, a beautiful friendship in every way. Um, yeah, I helped him out with history. He helped me out with a lot more than history. Um, he sharpened my wit insofar as I had one. Um, he taught me about life. He taught me about all kinds of things that only a great novelist can possibly do. So thanks to all of you. Um, for all you've done. Now, this is going to run a little long. I'm going to try to keep it short, as short as I can. Um, this, is, this, this lecture is, it has the title, American Slavery and the Relentless Unforeseen. That's the name of it. Um, you'll see what the second part of that means. But whenever I'm lecturing these days, I mean, it's a very difficult time in American history now. And so American history becomes difficult to talk about. And I find almost always, as I go around the country talking about American history, not just about American slavery, but American history generally, that there are bound to be awkward moments. From all sides, there's going to be awkward moments. There's probably a couple of awkward moments in what I just have to say, what I'm going to be saying now. And what I'm going to be asking is for, again, from all sides, when that awkward moment hits, take a deep breath. Think about what I have to say. You might find yourself changing your mind the same way that I changed my mind about this subject as I have about many other subjects. The nice thing about being an historian is you do generally, as long as you can hold it together, you get better as you get older. That isn't true for many professions. But you learn more, you get more, and you change your mind more and you find yourself being humbled by the past. This is an exercise in that, too. So, we begin with American slavery and the relentless unforeseen. But I want to start back with my friend Philip. Philip Roth, in his way, was a practicing historian. His historical writing took different forms and dated back a long time, at least as far as his fantastic transformation of the forlorn Cleveland Spiders, an actual baseball team that in 1899 compiled the worst record in Major League history, a record which still stands, <laughs> into the wacko Rupert Mundys of the great American novel published in 1973. His interest in history as a literary form and intellectual discipline deepened as he grew older and culminated in his counter-historical novel, The Plot Against America. Now, when he wrote that book, Philip was as scrupulous as any professional about getting his facts straight and making his counterfacts plausible. I know this because he took the trouble to hire one of my best undergraduates at Princeton as his research assistant and fact checker. He regarded historical facts and personages not as markers for his narrative, but as living things, things that might have easily turned out differently as in The Plot Against America, they temporarily did, and whose integrity demanded utmost respect. 
That respect explains why he resisted so strongly, once in my presence, the claims that his fictional rendering of the presidency of Charles A. Lindbergh, you remember from that novel, prophesized the ascendancy of Donald Trump. Despite Lindbergh's pro-Nazism, as Fulick explained in an email to Judith Thurman, he, quote, was a great aviation hero who had displayed tremendous physical courage and aeronautical genius in crossing the Atlantic in 1927. He had character and he had substance, and along with Henry Ford was worldwide the most famous American of his day. Trump is just a con artist, the real estate type, the callow and callous killer capitalist, who is also humanly impoverished, destitute of all decency. Having Lindbergh rise to the White House did not outstrip the novelist's imagination. Trump's rise did. Philip admired great historical writing and understood that to be truly great, it had to come to grips with what he called, also in the plot against America, the unfolding of the unforeseen. Flipped on its head, he wrote, the relentless unforeseen was what school children studied as history, a harmless history where everything unexpected in its own time is chronicled on the page as inevitable. The task of describing, let alone interpreting the past intelligibly, risks sliding how unexpected and largely unintelligible the past was to those who made it. As Philip put it in the mind of the novel's seven-year-old character, Philip Roth, quote, the terror of the unforeseen is what the science of history hides, turning a disaster into an epic. He might have added turning triumph into an epic as well. Roth's insight cuts to the heart of our most difficult and enduring historical issues. Above all, the centrality of slavery to American history. Although they diverge sharply, the most common accounts of American slavery have an air of inevitability about them. This is especially true regarding the abolition of slavery in 1865. Whether it's celebrated as a monument to freedom or slighted as a transition from one form of oppression to another, the course of emancipation can seem almost preordained, the product of essential features of American life. If anything, we wonder why it didn't happen sooner and condemn past generations for their hypocrisy, mendacity, and cruelty. Yet, few things, if any, in modern history were more unexpected than the eradication of human bondage in the Atlantic world. A fixture, a force in Western culture, time out of mind, Racial slavery had been essential to the European settlement of the New World ever since the Portuguese pioneered the plantation system with enslaved African labor in the 16th century. Apart from sporadic protests, the spread of slavery went virtually unchallenged by European and British settlers, let alone their governments. Periodic slave revolts and plots did not slow the rise of the plantation complex that at its, that at its height stretched from Brazil to the Caribbean, to British North America. There is evidence inside the Anglo-American world, dating back to the 17th century, of popular repugnance at slavery, and especially at the brutal African sl Atlantic slave trade, rather. But that sentiment slumbered for many decades, sufficient to raise moral doubts, but too feeble to produce political action. Suddenly, Suddenly, in the late 1740s and early 1750s, Western culture reached a turning point, producing what the great modern scholar of slavery and the anti-slavery movement, my teacher, David Bryan Davis, called, quote, an almost explosive consciousness of man's freedom to shape the world in accordance with his own will and reason. The causes of this moral, existential revolution were manifold 
and remain much debated and need not detain us here. What's important is that it brought, in Davis's words, quote, a heightened concern for discovering laws and principles that would enable human society to be something more than an endless contest of greed and power. That concern made slavery appear to the non-slaves for the first time as a barbaric offense to God, reason, and natural rights. Rejecting the dogmas of the past meant scrutinizing inequality, personal sovereignty, national sovereignty, and servitude of every kind. In France, Montesquieu's spirit of the laws destroyed ancient justifications for slavery, which inspired and emboldened anti-slavery religious sectarians and budding philosophes across the Atlantic world. In a far off corner of Pennsylvania, the pioneering Quaker abolitionist John Woolman, a major figure in the anti-slavery awakening, published his first anti-slavery pamphlet in 1754. A few years later, his friend and fellow Quaker, Anthony Benezet, began recruiting a network of intellectuals and political leaders to the cause. By the mid-1770s, in the American colonies, as well as in Britain and France, although more in the American colonies, as we'll see, a large number of reformers and intellectuals had come to regard American slavery as pure evil. Over the next 10 years, they set in motion political mo movements dedicated to eradicating the degradation of persons into property. Against slavery's millennia, the struggle to abolish it came abruptly. By the end of the succeeding century, against slavery's immense and unyielding power, it had largely succeeded. So, as a spiritual, as well as a political endeavor, it is one of the most, if not the most, astonishing unfoldings of the unforeseen in all of recorded human history. Yet it's too often, at best, consigned to the inevitable, the damned inevitable, as something that was bound to happen, as if in the natural unfolding of progress. At worst, it's pushed to the margins, as if slavery's abolition came without abolitionists, without politics, the byproduct, as some influential accounts say, of impersonal, amoral economic forces or the unintended outcome of white people's selfish squabbles over policy and profits, or even as an accident. The neglect of historical understanding of the anti-slavery impulse, especially in its early decades, alters how we view not just our nation's history, but the nation itself. More and more in these very pessimistic times, we are learning once again, and with a sense of justice, that the United States and its past are rooted in vicious racial slavery and the lasting inequities that are slavery's legacy. We learn too little, or not at all, that the United States and its past are also rooted in the struggle against slavery and in the larger revolutionary transformation of moral perception that produced that struggle. A transformation that, with all of its contradictions, helped give the new world its symbolic meaning of rebirth. Obscuring this essential tension that the United States was defined from the start, neither by slavery alone, nor by American anti-slavery, but in their conflict can lead to a strange complacency. Here's the first awkward moment. Because the ideals that propelled the American Revolution shared crucial origins with the ideals that propelled anti-slavery, it can be tempting to treat slavery as an unfortunate appendage at the nation's founding, outside the main lines of American history. It's a familiar view. Slavery, although an important part of American society, hardly encapsulated the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. It contradicted them, 
for reasons later explained by no less of an authority than Abraham Lincoln. The American Revolution, this view holds, may not have overthrown the institution of slavery, but its egalitarian principles were at least implicitly anti-slavery. The anomaly became more glaring over the succeeding two generations when in yet another unfolding of the unforeseen, American slavery did not die out as most expected, but expanded, turning the American South into the most dynamic and ambitious slavery regime in the world. Still, when emancipation arrived, it did so as a vindication and affirmation of Americans' founding principles, the rebirth of freedom that Lincoln pronounced at Gettysburg. It confounded the claims of those reactionary, pro-slavery apologists who belittled Thomas Jefferson as a cunning dissembler and who regarded the Declaration's assertion of self-evident equality as, in the words of one Indiana senator from 1854, quote, nothing more than a self-evident lie. Okay, awkward. One problem with this view is that it obscures how new, how radical anti-slavery politics were in the revolutionary era and how, for some patriots, American slavery and American freedom were perfectly compatible. I'm referring here not to those slaveholders with troubled consciences like Jefferson, James Madison, George Washington, Virginians who perceived slavery as an intolerable offense, yet who, at least after the 1780s in Jefferson's case, lifted not a finger toward ending it. Critics of slavery who continued owning, buying, and selling human beings until the day they died. I'm not talking about them. I'm referring instead to stridently pro-slavery figures, like that young South Carolina grandee and signer of the Constitution, Charles Pinckney, a patriot who served as an officer in the Revolutionary Militia and who, as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, in 1787, asserted, quote, if slavery be wrong, it is justified by the example of the whole world. I'm thinking of him. I'm also referring to those white Northerners, as well as most white Southerners, who believed that the Declaration's egalitarian principles were perfectly sound, but they did not categorically apply to black people, slave or free. Chief Justice Roger Brooke Tawney attempted finally to enshrine, enshrine rather, this racist egalitarianism in American national law in his notorious ruling in the Dred Scott case in 1857. Those pro-slavery Americans and apologists for slavery and their progeny were no less products of the American founding than the early abolitionists inspired by Woman and Benazette or the conflicted, enlightened Virginians like Jefferson. Plantation slavery grew stupendously after the American Revolution, generating a well-organized slave power that dominated national politics in the 1840s and 1850s. Slavery's defeat was not inevitable. There is another view, one that challenges that familiar one, hailed by its supporters for forcing an honest reckoning with slavery and its consequences. This account asks profound and unsettling questions about the nation's origins and bids us to regard the experience of the slaves as the true test of America's professed ideals. Slavery, in this view, wasn't simply an important part of American society at the founding and after. It defined a nation born in oppression and bad faith. While this view acknowledges the ideals of equality proclaimed by Jefferson and others, it regards them as hollow. Even after slavery ended, the racism that justified slavery persisted, not just as an aspect of American life, but at its very core, where it remains. Well, if the familiar view courts complacency, okay, another awkward moment, this one is vulnerable to an easy cynicism. Once slavery's enormity is understood as it should be 
not as a temporary flaw, but as an essential fact of American history. It's sometimes difficult to resist denigrating all egalitarian claims other than those made by enslaved persons and their descendants. It can make the birth of the American Republic and the subsequent rise of American democracy look as nothing more than the vindication of glittering generalities about freedom and equality founded on the oppression of blacks, enslaved and free, as well as the expropriation and slaughter of Native Americans. It can resemble, ironically, the reactionary pro-slavery insistence that the egalitarian self-evident truths of the Declaration of Independence were self-evident lies. And it can leave our understanding of American history susceptible to moralizing distortions that seem compelling simply because they question reassuring myth. Some of that cynicism, awkward moment, is on display in the New York Times Magazine's recently launched 1619 project. Enough to give some hostile conservative critics ammunition to try and discredit or minimize the entire enterprise of understanding America's history of slavery and anti-slavery. The project's lead essay, for example, by Nicole Hannah-Jones, berates our national mythology for, quote, conveniently omitting that one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare their independence from Britain was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. Supposedly, Britain, by 1776, had grown deeply conflicted over its role in the barbaric institution that had reshaped the Western Hemisphere, close quote. There were, the essay says, growing calls in London to abolish the slave trade, which would have upended the economy of the colonies in both the North and the South. Americans, in short, quote, may never have revolted against Britain had the founders not believed that independence, quote, was required in order to ensure that slavery would continue. That is, the American Revolution anticipated the slaveholders' rebellion of the Confederacy 80 years later. The Patriots allegedly declared their independence of Britain in 1776 for the same reason that the southern states seceded in 1860-61, to guarantee that slavery would endure. American independence in this view was a precursor of Southern secession. It's worth noting that Jefferson Davis and the rebellious slaveholders offered exactly the same argument when they depicted secession as a glorious replay of the revolution of 1776. Not for the first time, supposedly progressive modern critics have concluded, the Confederates were basically correct about American history, whereas Lincoln, and whereas most abolitionists, above all Frederick Douglass, whereas they were wrong. Neither the British government nor the British people were deeply conflicted over slavery in 1776. A controversy did arise in the 1760s and 1770s over the legality of owning slaves on British soil proper, which led to a very famous case declaring Britain free soil in 1772. But these efforts affected fewer enslaved persons than lived in the single colony of New York. More important, they affected Britain, Britain's entrenched involvement in colonial slavery and in the slave trade not one bit. Apart from the appeals of the solitary abolitionist Granville Sharp, a great man, there were no growing calls in London to halt the Atlantic slave trade. On the contrary, it had been the American colonists who attempted to end involvement in the Atlantic slave trade, only to be overruled by the Crown and its colonial officials. Hannah Jones's essay repeats the great British Tory Samuel Johnson's endlessly recycled quip about American hypocrisy, expressing mock astonishment at how, quote, we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes. Like other writings, 
that essay overlooks how the monarchist Johnson, with his own clever hypocrisy, had nothing to say about British involvement in the Atlantic slave trade, which was massive, let alone how sarcasm about the American patriot cause slandered prominent patriots who abhorred slavery in the slave trade and wanted them abolished, from Thomas Paine to Benjamin Franklin. Had the Americans not won their independence in 1783, it's almost inconceivable that the British government would have, would have ended slavery in any of its colonies thereafter. Although Lower South slaveholders and their northern allies succeeded in removing from the Declaration Jefferson's language describing the slave trade as, quote, a cruel war against human nature itself, violating the most sacred rights of life and liberty. And although Jefferson blamed the introduction of slavery, conveniently enough, on the monarchy, this hardly turned the fight for independence into a fight to sustain slavery. Cynicism about the revolution gives way to cynicism, cynicism about the Civil War, and in particular about Abraham Lincoln, rendered as a white supremacist who, whatever his qualms about human bondage, supposedly had no interest in ending slavery, but only in preserving the Union. One is left to wonder how Lincoln's first inaugural address, delivered weeks before the fighting began, affirmed to one admittedly unfriendly Northern editor, quote, that anti-slavery is the corpus, the strength, the visible life of the party, Lincoln's party, which has now assumed the reins of government. One is bidden to forget that the war was a slaveholder's counter-revolution against the victorious Republicans' explicit intention to place slavery, in Lincoln's words, in the course of ultimate extinction, and much else that Lincoln said against slavery, a counter-revolution that Lincoln was determined to crush. It took a year and a half, just a year and a half, before the Emancipation Proclamation officially turned that struggle against secession into a struggle for liberation under force of arms, fought in part by African-American Union troops who included more than 100,000 former slaves. That too was part of the Emancipation Proclamation. From the very start, though, the war for the Union was not an evasion over slavery. It was inherently anti-slavery. So the anti-slavery impulse, to be sure, has not disappeared completely from our accounts of American slavery. Historians rarely fail to credit the radical abolitionist movement that arose in the 1830s under the leadership of William Lloyd Garrison for courageously, courageously calling to account to moral account, not just the slaveholders, but their northern accomplices and apologists. Hannah Jones's essay cites the Pennsylvania anti-federalist and abolitionist Samuel Bryan attacking the US Constitution in 1787, as well as the later abolitionist William Goodell. Our current interpretations, though, fail to appreciate both the magnitude of the unforeseen anti-slavery rupture with the past and America's place in that rupture. They overlook how organized anti-slavery politics originated not in the old world, but in the rebellious British North American colonies. One line of argument finds it almost impossible to explain how most slaveholders and some anti-slavery advocates regard the nation's founding in 1787 as a blow for slavery. If everything was so anti-slavery, how can you explain Charles Pinckney and his racist delegates? You can't. But the other argument can't explain why leading abolitionists and anti-slavery voices fervently believed exactly the opposite, that the Constitution advanced the promise proclaimed by an anticipatory ode published in Philadelphia in 1787, quote, may servitude abolished be, as well as Negro slavery, to make one land of liberty. That was there as well. Placing anti-slavery, along with slavery, at the center of American history produces an unfamiliar 
Philip Rothian alternative history that tracks the unfolding of the unforeseen. Oh. Lacking a novelist's genius for invention, a historian can only record it. But the alternative account illuminates the fragility of history, not by telling what might have happened and didn't, as in the plot against America, but by relating unlikely things that did happen, disrupting all that seemed settled and foreclosed back then, as well as might now seem settled fact out of American history. Above all, above all, it shows that revolutionary America, far from a pro-slavery bulwark against the supposed enlightened, supposedly enlightened British Empire, was the greatest hotbed of anti-slavery politics in the Atlantic world. The history begins in the 1680s, at more or less the same time that plantation slavery was established in the Chesapeake. The year 1619 has become symbolic of slavery's commencement in our history, when a Dutch man of war sold 20 Africans and Creoles to John Rolfe at Jamestown. Only in the last quarter of the 17th century, however, did the slave plantation economy in tobacco really take root in the Chesapeake, followed immediately by the spread of plantation slavery in the rice, cotton, and indigo producing low regions, low country regions to the south. Slavery and slave trading likewise took hold in the colonies to the north, including New Jersey, particularly in the infant seaport cities where as much as one fifth of the population consisted of enslaved laborers as well as in the proximate hinterlands. What 1619 has become to the history of American slavery, 1688 is to the history of American anti-slavery, because that's the year when four German-speaking Quakers in the settlement of Germantown, Pennsylvania, raised what is generally regarded as the first white protest against African-American slavery in the British colonies. Denouncing slavery as a violation of the Golden Rule they initially directed their petition to the local Quaker monthly meeting, but it had no effect. In fact, it was forgotten until it was accidentally rediscovered in 1844. But anti-slavery sentiment persisted in Pennsylvania as part of what became a dissenting tradition inside the Society of Friends, aimed at a minority of pious Quakers against a more extravagant slaveholding and slave trading majority. People forget, in the 17th century, in the early 18th century, most wealthy Quakers owned slaves. Most wealthy Quakers owned slaves. Finally, though, in the 1750s, a full-scale reformation of American Quakerism produced a revulsion against what was still a fundamental institution in the Quaker's world. But the reformation did not extend very much beyond the friends. As late as 1763, okay, only a small minority of British or European, that is to say white, colonists anywhere in North America thought involvement in slaveholding or the slave trade, direct or indirect, deserved the slightest moral questioning. Yet, the moral revolution of the 1740s and 1750s, advanced on these shores by prophets like John Woolman, exploded after the Seven Years' War, amid the, the rising colonial of revolt against imperial rule. Couching political complaints not as assertions of customary English rights and liberties, but as tests of universal principles and natural rights rapidly dishonored holding Africans and their children in permanent slavery. As the wonderful historian Christopher Leslie Brown writes, quote, more than a decade before the development of abolitionism in Britain, the middle and northern colonies in North America presented the unusual spectacle of societies with slaves turning against the practice of human bondage, in part to abide by the dictates of professed values or to liberate themselves from human corruption. The next spectacle was most striking in the colonies where slavery was less central to the economy. 
But the contradictions of her time became glaring even where plantation slavery was the strongest. I always tell my students, South Carolina is just different. <laughs> always look to South Carolina if you want to understand something about pro-slavery thought. But remarking on the period of the 1770s, the leading South Carolina politician, Henry Lawrence, this guy was a major slaveholder. He may have even been the country's premier slave trader. He recalled, quite sincerely, how he and his fellow planters became, at least for a time, solemnly engaged, quote, against further importations under a pretense of working by gradual steps a total abolition. Over the succeeding decade, low country South Carolina planters would manumit more slaves than they had during the previous 30 years. So it's going on even down there, at least a little. But what's going on further to the north, including Virginia, is much greater. Between 1767 and 1775, a wave of anti-slavery petitions, sermons, pamphlets, private missives swamped the colonies from New England as far south as Virginia. At least half a dozen Massachusetts towns and several others in New England instructed their representatives to propose anti-slavery legislation at the colonial assemblies. Remember, slavery is legal in these places. There are slaves there, especially in the cities. In April 1775, five days before the battles of Lexington and Concord, a group of 10 Philadelphians, seven of them Quakers, formed the first anti-slavery organization in history, in all of human history, the Society for the Relief of Free Negroes, unlawfully held in bondage. Two months later, a group of local leaders met in Worcester, Massachusetts, to announce the determination to achieve the abolition of slavery. Well, that upsurge led to the greatest emancipation to that date in modern history, save perhaps the Marquis of Pombal's decree in 1761 that banned slavery in mainland Portugal and in Portuguese India. In 1777, fractious Vermonters adopted the first written constitution in history to outlaw adult slavery. That same year, when drafting its new state constitution, the New York State Legislature stopped short of approving emancipation, but endorsed the principle that their state should be free soil and exhorted future legislatures to take the most effective and prudent steps toward, quote, abolishing domestic slavery. Three years later, the Pennsylvania Assembly approved the first legislatively enacted emancipation law again in all of history. Four years after that, Rhode Island and Connecticut passed similar measures. Petitions and freedom suits initiated by slaves and pressed by anti-slavery legislators and, and lawyers undermined slavery's legitimacy in Massachusetts, leading to the landmark cases involving the slaves Quack Walker and Mumbet which in 1783 outlawed slavery under the terms of the Commonwealth's Constitution of 1780. The Atlantic slave trade came in for similar attack. Between 1769 and 1774, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland either passed highly restrictive duties on slave imports and effectively banning it, or banning the imports outright. Measures abolishing the trade also won approval in Massachusetts, New York, and Delaware, only to be thwarted by royal governors. The Virginia General Assembly, calling the commerce in human beings an inhumanity, quote, passed high duties on the slave trade in 1767, 1769, and 1772, rejected on each occasion by the King's Privy Council. Finally, the Continental Congress, acting in 1774 and 1776, halted the trade until the end of the Revolutionary War. So, so, so here it is. By 1787, five northern states had either abolished slavery or put it in the course of abolition. New York, the largest slaveholding state north of, er north of Maryland, had hotly debated abolition and come close to enacting emancipation law in 1785. Public debates in New Jersey, which as we know was the sole holdout until 1804. Still, New Jersey had been roiled by talk of abolition from neighboring states. In Virginia, 
where the legislature liberalized man emission laws in 1782, lawmakers seriously debated a gradual emancipation proposal initiated by a statewide petition campaign. Now, it needs emphasizing. It's really important to remember that outside of northern New England, where slavery was crumbling anyway, these successes were hard won. They were not easy. It wasn't easy getting rid of slavery in these northern states. In some portions of northern New England and the middle states, slavery and slave trading were important to the local economy. But slaveholders everywhere ferociously fought any kind of emancipation. The heart of the matter for them was property rights, an issue that won over many non-slaveholders to their side. No state was prepared to offer full direct compensation to the slaveholders for freeing slaves by law. Britain, by the way, would actually give its colonial slaveholders compensation in 1831. Slaveholders who wielded outsized political power charged that anything short of such a compensation was, as one pro-slavery New Jerseyan put it, quote, a solemn act of public robbery or fraud. Beginning in Pennsylvania, the abolitionist legislators had to settle for compromises that freed the children of slaves immediately, but placed them in a period of indentured servitude that in some states, at the slaveholders' insistence, ran four to seven years beyond the age of majority, which was 21. To the most fervent abolitionists, these compromises amounted to a fraud, to a bogus emancipation that still left slaves, as one of them put it, groaning under the rod of a cruel, unfeeling tyrant. Most historians today appear to agree, describing northern emancipation with a touch of cynicism, not as the product of intense political struggle between insurgent abolitionists and politically powerful slaveholders, but as a grudging, half-hearted enterprise that rewarded slaveholders with a kind of indirect compensation. Their accounts ignore how, with unprecedented force and against the immense weight of the past, abolitionists and their political allies initiated the abolition of an entire category of property. I look at you lawyers out there, an entire category of property. By any measure, a radical act in a world dedicated to the guarantee of property is a vested right. The accounts slight how even the most gradual emancipation laws immediately broke the chattel slavery principle regarding the children of slaves, which was a cornerstone of American slavery. They overlook how resistant slaveholders forever considered the measures repugnant and oppressive, unjust, unjustly depriving slaveholders, one Massachusetts jurist wrote, quote, of property formally acquired under protection of law. Maybe most important, the accounts suppress how the legislation formally branded slaveholding, remember, an institution almost universally deemed among white people perfectly valid less than 20 years earlier, these laws branded it an abomination. One that according to the 1780 Pennsylvania law robbed slaves of the common blessings of nature while casting them into the deepest afflictions. As its victories piled up, the haphazard anti-slavery movement began to cohere and push for still larger reforms regarding its previous successes, according to the Pennsylvania law, as, quote, just one more step to universal civilization, more steps to come. In 1784, the Philadelphia abolitionist group, having suspended operations during the war, reorganizes the Pennsylvania Society for the promotion of the abolition of slavery. A year later, New Yorkers formed their own manumission society. By the end of, the 17, end, end of 1790, at least six more self-styled abolition societies had appeared from Rhode Island to Virginia and working very closely, particularly in Philadelphia and New York, with black churches that were getting going in the 1790s as well. The American movement in turn became the anti-slavery beacon to the rest of the Atlantic world and especially to the beleaguered British abolitionists like Ranville Sharp. Having formally berated the colonials as slaveholders, Sharp would go on to credit the American abolitionists with whom he built close connections 
for moving him to trace, quote, the evil to its source. Sharp's broadcasting of American, American anti-slavery and anti-slave trade tracts became the foundation for the massive British agitation against the slave trade that began in the late 1780s. For Sharp, as for other British abolitionists friendly to the patriot cause, the American Revolution loomed as a kind of civil war within the British Empire that promised to eradicate slavery of every kind. As we know, Sharp and the others were wrong. <laughs> they could not have been more wrong. Slavery's eradication was not forth forthcoming anytime soon. In the Lower South, where the humanitarian ripples from the 1770s and 1780s died, slaveholders deemed slavery not simply as a necessity for their economic survival, but as a scripturally sound and even noble institution ratified by the example of the entire world. In Virginia, enlightened slaveholders like Jefferson faced the reality that pro-slavery planters ruled the roost in their own state, and in any case that they possessed neither the strategy nor the will to pick up on the example of northern emancipation. When the delegates to the Constitutional Convention assembled in Philadelphia in 1787 to design a stronger federal union, there was never a question about their granting the new national government authority over slavery in the states where it already existed. That's why we, you know, it just wasn't going to happen. Southern slaveholding states were not about to give the new government the power to abrogate their property laws any more than northern states would surrender power over their property laws. Still, anti-slavery delegates, and there were several, to the Constitutional Convention, urged on by organized abolitionists outside the convention's closed, door, closed doors, aimed at the very least to ensure that the government had the authority to abolish the Atlantic slave trade, the new national government, which was to that point the, vi the vital first step in every blueprint yet devised for, American, for ending American slavery. Lower South slaveholders, the Carolinians, violently refused, and they declared the matter non-negotiable. Either leave the slave trade untouched and in the hands of the individual states, the rebarbative South Carolinian John Rutledge announced, or the Lower South, quote, shall not be parties to the Union. Yet while they managed to salvage a significant 20-year delay and came away with enough to satisfy their constituents that they had secured a pro-slavery triumph, the slaveholders lost the main issue. The Constitution conceded to the slaveholding states a measure of extra representation in Congress and in the Electoral College, although it was far from determinative, and it gave them a very weakly worded clause on returning fugitive slaves. The convention majority refused, however, to acknowledge slavery's legitimacy in national law, which gave the new national government authority over slavery wherever it exercised jurisdiction, as in the national territories, which is going to become a big deal in the 1840s and 1850s. Above all, as the abolitionists had dearly hoped and the slaveholders deeply feared, the convention specifically authorized the national government not simply to regulate the Atlantic slave trade, but to abolish it. Well, the pro-slavery Southerners, wary of their constituency, constituents back home, declared victory, proclaiming that the concessions they had gained in Philadelphia were sufficient to secure slavery permanently under the new Constitution. Some Southerners knew better. We can talk about that later. As with gradual emancipation, some of the most ardent anti-slavery advocates, abolitionists, especially in New England, denounced the convention's work as a sellout to tyranny. Many, if not most, prominent abolitionists, however, including the renowned physician and secretary of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, Benjamin Rush, hailed the Constitution, and in particular its provisions on the slave trade. Quote, how honorable to America, one widely reprinted Pennsylvania essay observed, to have been the first Christian power that has borne a testimony against so repugnant a practice as the Atlantic slave trade. 
How extraordinary, another, remar another writer remarked, that in this new country, we should, in less than 150 years, possess a degree of liberal liberality in humanity, which has been unknown during so many centuries, and which is, as, uh, which is yet unattained in so many parts of the globe. In Providence, Rhode Island, an assembly of free people of color celebrated the Constitution and its, quote, prospect of a stop being put to the trade to Africa in our fellow creatures. The struggle, which remember was barely imaginable to a previous generation, had only just begun. For much of the ensuing 70 years, the slaveholders would secure the initiative in national politics, not because of the three-fifths clause or any concession from the framers, but because of the support they received from northern conservatives. Northern conservatives did more to keep slavery alive than any other single group, in my view, apart from the slaveholders, of course. Beginning in the 1790s, the renaissance of American plantation slavery, produced by a revolution in cotton production, turned early visions of a yeoman's republic into the reality of an American slaveholder's regime beyond anything slavery's early champions, even Charles Pinckney, could have imagined. Yet the struggle never ceased. As early as the very first Congress, abolitionists roiled the House of Representatives with petitions demanding members to press to the very limits of their powers to abolish the Atlantic slave trade and slavery itself. The movement began in 1790. Here and there, anti-slavery advocates won some unlikely victories, passing measures eventually discarded to choke off slavery's advance into the newly acquired Louisiana Territory. Laws were passed that were going to abolish slavery, keep slavery out of the Louisiana Territory. They weren't implemented. It all went away. But the struggle was continuing. Fending off pro-slavery efforts to undermine the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade, which was achieved at the earliest possible date in 1808. And then finally forcing a major crisis over the expansion of slavery concerning Missouri's admission to the Union in 1819 and 1820. A quarter century after that, the rise of the Republican Party, the Lincoln Republican Party, dedicated to the single object, and the Frederick Douglass Republican Party, dedicated to the single object of halting slavery's expansion to hasten its doom, commenced what soon enough became the final conflict. That history was not harmless. It was not peripheral. Nothing about it was inevitable. It began with perhaps the greatest unforeseen transformation in modern history, the rise of anti-slavery ideas and arguments. Americans, earlier than anywhere else, turned that transformation into the politics that pledged to bring slavery to its ultimate extinction. In reaction, Americans also produced the mightiest pro-slavery resistance to those politics the world had ever seen and has seen thus far. And through the Confederacy came perilously close to establishing an American empire of slavery, if not for what Lincoln called the terrible war that rendered, that rendered a result which was fundamental and astounding. Cynicism about this history defeats understanding as surely as complacency does. So we are left to contemplate as both Philip Roth, the writer, and Philip Roth, the character he created, tried to do the terror and the triumph of the unforeseen. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Wilenz. Sir. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And you all stayed, so that means it wasn't so long, right? <laughs> okay, very good. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeremy Johnson. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to recognize the president of the New York City Council, Mildred Crump, who joined us. Thank you for being here with us. <laughs> I, 
I have the distinguished pleasure of doing the Q&A portion of this evening, and I think I'm going to be well, well, facilitated. You, you, you're going to do the Q part, and I'm going to do the A oh. part, right? Okay, very good. No. Just make sure we got it. Yeah, okay, got it right. So I think I'll be facilitated by my colleagues, Professor Junius Williams and uh, Tom Alrutz of the New York Public Library Board. All right, so if you had one of these, you can start these uh, cards and your pencil, you can start filling them out right now. So I'll do my best, Professor. I'm curious, uh, this first question is, I'm curious about the pivotal role of Anthony Benize, help me with that pronunciation, and I wonder if you can say more about him. Yes, Anthony Benizet deserves a monument um, on the mall. Um, he was a great Quaker abolitionist who in the 1760s, um, he wasn't a great um, theorist, but he was a great organizer. He wrote several important pamphlets, but he was really good at organizing, and he recruited people from across the Atlantic world to the cause of anti-slavery in the 1760s. He recruits Benjamin Rush, I mentioned him. He writes to the French. He writes to Granville Sharp. He starts a big correspondence with the British abolitionists. If John Woolman is the, um, the prophet of Quaker abolitionism, Anthony Benezet is the organizer. He's the organizer that you need to keep it going. Um, and, and Benjamin Franklin. I mean, Benjamin Franklin was a slaveholder who ran runaway ads in his paper back in the 1730s, 1740s. By the time we get to 1787, he is the president of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. That had a lot to do, I mean, Anthony Benezet had a lot to do with changing his mind. Franklin's not a Quaker, but, but he, you know, he had a lot to do with that. So there are many, the, the story of this movement is filled with extraordinary you know, individuals, people, of all kinds, um, and I could barely mention you know, some of them now. Um, you know, we can go on about them. I, I hope to, in a book I'm going to be writing, it's a pre, uh, an advanced you know, adver advertisement. It's, not, it's going to take a while. It's a long book. But it will be trying to get all of these stories there. All right, we'll keep it moving. Speaking of awkward moments, um, there are lot, lots that we're talking about. And I, I have to say, as a great-great-grandson, of enslaved Americans. This really gave us, so many of us in this room, a lot of room for thought. One thing I love about our great city of Newark, we can hear so many words that we're hearing today, a city of Philip Roth, a city of Amiri Baraka, a city of many esteemed writers. So with that, let me get to the next question. What are the merits of the call for reparations? Ah, you're putting me, I'm a historian, guys. You're making me into a politician all of a sudden. Oh. I think the moral case for reparations is, is open and shut. I think there's any question. You know, there have been reparations paid in modern history to all sorts of groups that have been oppressed and exterminated. So the moral question is, is to me, is, is not a no-brainer. The right? question is, how do you do it politically? And, you know, this is where my historian but also politician side or political side reigns in. It's going to be a very tough lift in this country to get that done. So you have to think about ways to do it. Um, my guess is that if you want to talk about that and push it, um, you ought to be thinking starting at the local level rather than at the national level. And, um, and maybe, you know, the, the, you know, the associate city fathers and mothers here in Princeton, here in Princeton, I almost said. We, we would ne never mind. Here in Newark, the great city of Newark, can, can start talking about a local, you know, a local call for things that can be done um, rather than doing it nationally. Because doing it nationally is a, is a very heavy lift. Next question. Would slavery have ended sooner if slave owners were significantly financially compensated for freeing their slaves? Fair market value for property? No. All right. No. Let's keep it moving. No. I mean, Abraham Lincoln discovered this himself. Um, the idea of gradual emancipation still remains the order of the day through most of the 19th century. You know, even Britain, you know, it's, it's, it's compensated gradual emancipation in Britain in the 1830s. But after the Civil War starts, after the South secedes and they start you know, shooting guns and stuff, Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln, went to the slaveholders of Delaware and offered compensated emancipation for the slaveholders in Delaware. There were maybe 17 slaveholders left in Delaware. No, I, I'm exaggerating, but it was not, it was not a big, as big a deal as it had been once and certainly compared to Maryland and on South. 
Delaware was a small slaveholder state, and the slaveholders refused Abraham Lincoln. It's one of the reasons, in fact, why Lincoln, I think, gets in, moves to the Emancipation Proclamation, is he realizes these slaveholders are hopeless. They're never going to give way. For, you, know, you can pay them all the, the money that their you know, property's worth, et cetera, et cetera. It also would have recognized slaves as property, which Lincoln did not believe in. But he was willing to do that if it could bring about a peaceful ending of this system, this evil system. And slaveholders said no. Not only because of the idea that they wanted these slaves so much, right? Because they were going to make so much money. I mean, Delaware, right? Um, it was about property. Their idea that we bought it, it's mine. Right? You belong, this slave belongs to me, right? It's my property. They didn't want to give that up. And, and so it was tenacious. The slaveholders, look, <laughs> They, they fought in a suicidal war, right, to keep slavery going. You know, um, for every, um, you know, drop of blood drawn with the lash, there was run one drawn by the sword. They paid the penalty for their tenacity, but they were tenacious. Very good. Let me go to one about... Uh, Anti-slavery does not equal anti-racism, this writer writes. And how do you explain the absence of strong opposition among whites to the colonization movement? The absence of strong opposition from whites to the colonization movement. There was, there was you know, the abolitionist movement of the 1830s started in black protests to colonization, but then whites picked up on it. And the, 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 the Garrisonian movement is based on rejecting colonization. So it's important to recognize that, you know, maybe the most, what should we say, the leading edge of American abolitionism, certainly in the 1830s, is not only not going along with colonies, it is saying, no, this is ridiculous. This is, you know, inhuman. And they're, you know, they're, they're talking about equal rights for blacks and whites. I mean, they are, they are consciously anti-racist. Now, is most of the anti-slavery movement anti-racist? No, probably not. Um, there's a spectrum along the line. Um, in America, to be a white person in the 1840s and 50s, to say that Africans do not deserve to be slaves, that in a sense is backing off from the standard racist position. It's not anti-racism, right? But it's, it's, it's moving away from something that had been taken for granted for centuries, millennia. We have to bear that in mind. That's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to apologize for anybody. I'm trying to say how complicated an historical process it is. Now, through the Civil War, it's interesting. People who look at, you want to talk about ordinary white people in the Civil War, look at the Civil War soldiers, right? They're about as ordinary as you get in the Union Army, right? They're not privileged, they're just, they're the troops. If you read their diaries, in the beginning, they, they, they don't like the slaveholders, they don't like slavery much. But they're not much on emancipation, you know? They're not, they're not pushed towards emancipation. When you read their diaries by the end of the war, and a colleague of mine has read hundreds of these damn things. It's penance had to read those diaries. But, but, but you can see a real shift. You know, politics and revolutions open up people. People who otherwise might have been, you know, um, what should we say, obdurate or not thinking. Political events, those of us who lived in the, through the 60s know this. Politics can open things up even for people who were closed-minded. And the Civil War was a revolution. Now, it's quite true that not too long after the revolution, the reaction came in, and racism is reinstalled, you know, the system that we all know what happened after that. Revolutions do go backwards. I think that's a subject we know a lot about in this country, actually, <laughs> that revolutions do go backwards. On but, that note, that might lead to this next okay. question, which gets to current events, I think. Okay. Uh, so on Wikipedia, mm -mm. You were quoted about the worst American president. Do you want to update that <laughs> quote? Who, who asked that question? Yeah, yes. I know it's anonymous and stuff. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, in, 19, in 2006, I wrote a piece for Rolling Stone, that great historical journal, <laughs> academic journal, Rolling Stone magazine, which I, I also hang out with sometimes. Um, the, uh, the, asking the historical question, was George W. Bush the worst president in American history? Now, 
I didn't want to completely answer that question right at the time. The question is, do I want to change my, right? Yes and no. And it goes to the article that, that, that Brenda was referring to earlier. I think that if you go back and look, the, the only thing that, you know, George Bush is very happy that Trump is president, not because of what Trump is doing, because he's making him look good. <laughs> he's even said that. You know, with that kind of smirky, you know, making me kind of look good. That guy. Um, Look, and look back at the George W. Bush administration and you will see a great deal of what we most lament about Trump was being pioneered back then. The collapse of the Western Alliance with the Iraq War. Um, the truth, the lies that were told to the American people to get us to go into Iraq, they made truth out the window. So, so let's not think that, that, that Donald Trump was a complete break from what happened before. I think there are, there, there's a continuity which we also have to take into account. Did you ever talk to Philip Roth about Bob Dylan? <laughs> <laughs> See, here's the problem, right? Like, I'm half Jewish, right? And the two great Jewish guys that are up for the Nobel Prize are both my friends, right? So how am I supposed to deal with that, right? Um, we didn't talk about it a whole lot, but there is a story, and it's true, and I think Ben will confirm this. Um, right afterwards, I mean, Philip knew what I was, you know, I, I, close to Bob, Dylan, blah, blah. But he knew that I, you know, the, the only thing that made me feel bad about Bob Dylan getting the Nobel Prize is that Philip Roth didn't get the Nobel Prize. Okay? That was the only thing that made me feel bad about it. But Philip was supposed to have said, I, it's true, when he was told that, that Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize, he was supposed to say, well, that's okay, but next year, I hope Peter, Paul, and Mary get it. Mm. <laughs> That's, I mean, this guy was funny, right? <laughs> he, being with Philip Roth was like being with a combination of like, you know, um, Lenny Bruce and Red Fox at the same time. You know, I mean, you just were walking away laughing all the time. Yes. We have time for one or two more. Um, uh, back to the current day. Would you comment on President Trump's warning of civil war over impeachment? Would I comment on it? Maybe we should tweet about it. Oh, boy. Um, I think that the president is trying to incite um, the racist elements in his base, and that that's what that's about. It's as simple as that. And they are violent. His campaign was violent. Um, you know, I think the president is, 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 a, is, is a menace, not for all the reasons that we know about, but I mean, he's, he is spiritually a menace to, to the American people, and he's is, is inciting, a, you know, the, he actually tweeted somebody else who said that. So let me get, you know, being an historian, I have to get all the facts straight, right? Some crazy minister somewhere said that, and he retweeted it. Um, but he's endorsing it, right? And, um, you know, I just think that it's, that it's, you know, that should be an article impeachment in itself, that tweet. Very simple question here. Is the U.S. still a democracy? Hmm. If you can keep it. On that note, folks, we thank you, Professor Sean Wallen. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. Thank you all.